you get your Bibles ready, we'll be in Exodus chapter number 3 and continuing the life of Moses, advancing with God. And that's what we're trying to do. Of course, we've been fighting all kinds of things over the last year with the COVID and and we started getting folks back, and, and then you, you know your weather and all these different things going on. But we got to keep on moving on forward with God, and that's the life of Moses. We come to probably the most familiar story in the life of Moses, the burning bush, Exodus chapter number three, and to try to bring out some truths there that God has taught me this week. Before I come with the message, Brother Morgan's come to sing, and to please allow God to speak to you through song and then through message. Could it be that up in heaven God is sitting on his throne anticipating another sinner that will soon become his own years of wasted living and years of toil and strife are just about to be over as he receives the gift of life Go sound the horn, strike up the choir. A sinner is saved, saved from the fire. No more in darkness, he's received my son. All heavens rejoicing, that's the value of one. Amen. The Holy Spirit has been working to soften up their hearts. All he needs is a willing servant who will simply do his part. Could you imagine up in heaven the joy that will be that day? As a sinner bows his head to pray, can you hear the Father say, Go sound the horn, strike up the choir. A sinner is saved, saved from the fire. No more in darkness, he's received my son. All heavens rejoicing, that's the value of one. Start construction on his mansion there on Hallelujah Street. He doesn't know yet that it's waiting till the Savior he will meet. Go sound the horn, strike up the choir. A sinner is saved, saved from the That's the value of one. Amen. 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 Right. Amen. Praise the Lord. And all heaven does rejoice when one sinner trusts Christ as Savior. Amen. And we thank the Lord that the Lord is still in the soul-saving business even in our day. Amen. And thank you, Brother Morgan. Exodus chapter 3. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Again, we're advancing with God. Exodus chapter number 3, the life of Moses. And we come now. Boy, we are fast forwarding, aren't we? I mean, he was born two weeks ago. And last week, he's 40 years of age. And now he's 80 years of age. How many feel like that's how life goes, though? I mean, it's like, man, you blink and you're like, wow, I'm a decade older than what I was. And uh, we're flying through Moses' life. It's like dog years here. One week, he goes 40 from 40 to 80. He's 80 years of age now, chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush, bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. 
I tell you, I would have been turning aside, but I would have been turning and running. Yeah. Verse 4. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. I would have really been running then, wouldn't you? And said, Moses, Moses. It's interesting in the Bible when God says your name twice, you better hear. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Tyler and Brandy's little girl Blakely came in on Wednesday night in her bare feet. And I said, hey, that's good. She's on holy ground, isn't she? Verse 6. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Notice this phrase. And Moses hid his face. For he was afraid to look upon God. Wow. In America, we need to get that kind of view of our God once again. Verse number one. I want to draw your attention to that phrase, the backside of the desert. Have you ever been there? I mean, a barren land. You feel like life is just dry and fruitless. Aren't you glad God shows up even on the backside of the desert? Let's look at it. God's taught me a lot this week through this passage, and, and I pray God would speak to me and you. Let's pray. Father, we do love you. Thank you for the word of God. Lord, it's all the in, infallible, inspired, preserved word, but we come to texts like this, and Lord, I, I feel like I am on holy ground. And Lord, we know that thou art an awesome God, and we stand in all of thee. We fear thee, O God, that thou art the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Lord, that thou art the same God today that burned in that fiery burn, in, in, uh, that fiery bush. And thou art the same God that went with the Hebrews in the fiery furnace. And we thank you, Lord, you're with us on the backside of the desert as well. I pray you'd fill me with the Spirit of God. Please speak to our hearts, we pray. And uh, Lord, if there's a lost soul in our midst or watching, Lord, there is value in that soul. And we pray for that soul's salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Well, when I think about desert, certain words come to my mind. I think of barrenness. I think of a wasteland. I think of cracked, parched soil. I think of dry, desolate land. Uh, I think of roadrunners and coyotes. How many are in my generation, you know, of Wild E. Coyote and the Roadrunner and uh, Acme Products? Remember that, you know? And in my mind, that's what I'm thinking. And right now, you're like, man, I just had a flashback to my childhood. And you're seeing that little Roadrunner and you're seeing a Wild E. Coyote jump off the, the cliff. And man, as a kid, I thought, how many lives does this guy have? You know, he keeps coming back to life again. And so in your mind, imagine that this wasteland, this desert, this dry and this parched land. And I want to say that is very symbolic of what all of us go, and go through in lives at certain periods of our lives. Every one of us, we all go through deserts in life. I mean, times when things are fruitless and barren and dry. Have you ever been there? I mean, and let's, for a minute, take off your, your self-righteous mask. Let's just be honest, okay? Have you, ever read your, have you ever read your Bible and just, maybe it's just dry. I mean, you're not getting what you always get. Or your prayers, your prayer life is just not, not what it once was. And we go through that. All of us go through that. Some of those desert times in our lives, those dry times. Preachers go through those dry spells in life when ministry maybe seems barren or dry. And over the last year, maybe you felt like that's how your life has been. Just a desert, a wilderness, dry and barren. And it has been a struggle. And again, I want to say no matter how good of a Christian you are, we all go through those dry deserts in our lives. Through them, we have to be faithful to the Lord, but we all go through those. I think about Moses. He spent 40 years on the backside of the desert. It's ironic that uh, Elijah spent 40 days and 40 nights in the same place, Mount Horeb. And you remember that where, where he's questioning God and even under the juniper tree and wants to die. He went through a literal desert and a symbolic desert, just a wilderness time for 40 days and 40 nights. I think about John the Baptist. He began preaching. Where did he begin preaching? Out in the desert, out in the wilderness. I think about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Even the Lord had a desert experience. Remember, for 40 days and 40 nights, he went out into the desert and the devil tempted him. And I want to tell you this morning, when you are in the desert in your life, you're in a dry and barren time in your life, I can, you can mark it down. Satan is going to meet you out there and he's going to tempt you out there. Even the mighty apostle Paul, after he got saved and got baptized, if you study it, for three years, he went out into the desert in Arabia. I'm just saying if Paul had a desert and if the Lord had a desert and if Moses had a desert and if Elijah had a desert, then you and I are going to face desert experiences in our lives. Notice that word in verse one, the backside of the desert, D-E-S-E-R-T. If you add E-D on that word, you get deserted. And how many of you have ever been in a desert and you felt deserted by God? You don't have to raise your hand on that. But I think we've all been there. Where are you, Lord? Why did my loved one die? Or why did my loved one get sick? Or why did I lose my job? Or again, maybe you're reading the Bible and it's, it's a little stale to you. Or your prayers, you feel like they're not getting answered. And, and when you're going through a desert, many times we feel deserted. I want to say on the authority of God's word, God says in Hebrews 13 and verse 5, thank God I will never leave thee and I will never forsake you. And you can mark this down, whether you're in the green lush pastures or you're in a dry and desolate, barren desert land, the God of heaven will not leave you and he will not abandon you and he will not forsake you and he will not desert you. You are not deserted when you go through the desert. But sometimes we feel like it, don't we? Larry and Lionel Bell Barrett are missionaries sent out of my home church. And they've been missionaries to uh, Brazil for almost 50 years. In fact, two different families, the Barretts and the Tylers. We support Jeremy Tyler. He's a second generation missionary. But his parents, Gary and Pam Tyler, the Tylers and Barretts, in the early 1970s, both uh, were called of God to go to Brazil out of our local church. And so our family has been very, very close to them for years. And they have served faithfully. The Barretts have served faithfully in Brazil for nearly 50 years. Well, back in uh, around Thanksgiving, Brother Larry Barrett, who's in his 70s, uh, got COVID. And every day I, I would get a text and get an update and just in Brazil and, and just obviously the providence of God also. But this past week he went to be with the Lord. It broke our hearts. Not for him, thank God, he's kicking up gold dust in heaven, but for us. And I got an audio text on Wednesday, right before the Wednesday night service, from a lady in our church, my home church, but it was from Lida Bell Barrett, an audio text that was sent to me. And it's about, it was about five minutes long. I thought about playing it, but I didn't have permission from her. But I tell you, it would touch your heart. You talk about a desert. I imagine she feels a little deserted. I'm in Brazil. I'm serving God. I'm a missionary. And my husband's called to be with the Lord. What does she do now? Will she still get missionary support? Her husband's with the Lord. Should she come off the field? You can imagine the, the thoughts going through her mind right now. But she said this on the audio text. She said, I just want you all to know that even through this valley, the Lord has given me a peace that passes understanding. Amen. And then she said this, and whether the Lord calls me home now or later, I just want to be faithful to the Lord all the days of my life. Amen. Man, isn't that precious? What is your point, preacher? My point is, that's a desert. You talk about a dry land. I mean, here you are, you're in a foreign land, Brazil, and you've been serving God all these years, and, and your husband's called and home to glory. And what do you do at that time? I'm so glad we are not deserted when we go through the desert. When we are on the backside of the desert, the Lord is with us. And I think God wants to teach us some important lessons on the backside of the desert. And I want to give you some that God has taught me as I've studied this text. Number one, we learn about the plan of God on the backside of the desert. That's the first lesson. We learn about the plan of God on the backside of the desert. Look again at verse one, please. The Bible says, now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert. 
You recall that Moses, last week we studied, fled from Egypt because it was found out that he had killed an Egyptian man. And he, he dwelt in the land of Midian and he marries a woman by the name of Zipporah and he begins to work for his father-in-law. Can you imagine working for your father-in-law? I love my father-in-law. And uh, he's, he's one of my heroes. He is an absolutely brilliant man. He's a fascinating man. I just love that guy. I just don't know if I'd want to work for him. And I really don't know if I'd want to work for him for 40 years. Can you imagine working for your father-in-law for 40 years? Now, remember this from last week. We've got to get the context. Moses was the heir to the throne, we believe, of being the king of Egypt. The most powerful man in the world, you could argue, at that time. And he goes from that to now not only being a shepherd, which is about the lowest job you can have on the totem pole, but he doesn't even have his own flock. He is watching the flock for his father-in-law. And you have to think, as I would, then he's on the backside of the desert saying, Lord, I don't understand. The 40 years in the palace, but then 40 years in the pasture. And it's not good pasture. It's the backside of the desert there in Horeb. And now I would have to imagine he said to God, God, the children of Israel, my people are suffering and, and they're killing these baby boys. And, and the midwives are crying out to God for a deliverer. And I thought I was the deliverer. I tried to deliver the people and, and, and they just booted me out of the country. Oh, God, I, I don't understand your plans. And for 40 years, I've been just walking around, wasting my life, watching these sheep. Where are you, God? And where is your plan for my life? I tell you, the back Outside the desert, the devil shows up and he puts a lot of wrong thoughts in your minds. And no doubt he questioned the plans of God there in the backside of the desert. And I'm saying it is easy to question God's plans when you're in the desert. And we've got to remember that God's plans are higher than our plans. And God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. I love Isaiah 55 and verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And waiting time is not wasted time. Please follow me. God, in his infinite plan and in his perfect timing, he was training, he was grooming, he was preparing Moses. And for 40 years, he was watching sheep and learning how to lead sheep because for the next 40 years of his life, he was going to be watching sheep and learning how to lead sheep. And if you know anything about the next 40 years of Moses' life, I promise you watching the sheep, bah, was a lot easier than watching those other sheep. We'll learn about that as we travel through the life of Moses. I mean, you talk about some complaining, murmuring, griping sheep. And what was God doing? God was planning and preparing Moses for the next 40 years of his life. And ironically, he was going to lead them right through the same desert that he was in. And I have to ask you, and, and I want you to consider this. What is the Lord trying to teach you in the desert? What is the Lord preparing for your life? It's not wasted time going through the desert. Maybe you say the last 11 years of my life, it's been a wasted time. I can't wait, wait to get rid of this pandemic. I'm saying God has something for you and God has something for me. God has a plan even on the backside of the desert. And so number one, we learn about the plan of God on the backside of the desert. Number two, would you write this down? We learn about the power of God on the backside of the desert. Because as Moses is on the backside of the desert, the Bible says in verse two, that the angel of the Lord appeared unto him. Would you mark these words? In a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed it seemed like an everyday backside the desert experience there at Mount Horeb. Moses is there with his sheep and suddenly the angel of the Lord appears. And we'll get to the, the angel of the Lord in just a minute. But here's this bush and it's on fire. That would get your attention, wouldn't it? I mean, let's suppose Brother Lee and I uh, went out hunting and he's at his spot and I'm at my spot. And uh, we both have... Uh, we both are looking for deer, and uh, we're sitting there, and I'm, I'm just sitting there, and the next thing I know, this bush is on fire. Well, that would get my attention. 
But when I look at the bush and it's on fire and it's not consumed, now it really gets my attention. Are you all with me there? I mean, a, a shrub. I, I was looking up the Egyptian bushes and it was a sticky shrub. It was wooden as what we would think of it. Well, what do, bu what do wooden bushes do? What do shrubs do? When they are on fire, they burn up. And so I suppose Moses is there. He's thinking maybe about the children of Israel or about Zipporah or about whatever in life. And this bush gets his attention and it's burning, but it's not consumed. That would get your attention. But then when a voice comes out of the bush, that would really get your attention. I mean, again, Brother Lee and I were hunting. He's on his spot. I'm on my spot. Here's a bush. It's on fire, but it's not consumed. And I'm about to walkie-talkie, Brother Lee, and say, hey, something weird's going on. And about the time I'm walkie-talking him, this bush begins to talk to me. Brother, I don't know about you. I'm out of there at that point. And then when I can tell that the bush is the voice of God, you talk about getting your attention. And God begins to speak to Moses out of a burning bush. Let me say this before I move on. You never know where God will speak to you, and you never know when God will speak to you. We often think God only speaks to us in loud, bombastic ways. Man, God can speak to you with this still, small voice, and God can speak to you out of a burning bush. And Moses, you would think, would have run off, but he did not. This bush was on fire, but it was not consumed. And let me take a, a rabbit trail for just a minute and say this, that the burning bush to me is symbolic of several things. The burning bush is a symbol of the preservation of Israel. Hear me now. Israel has gone through many fiery furnaces. And there have been many times when we thought Israel was going to be consumed. But I want to tell you, they've never been consumed because they are God's chosen people. They've been through the fire, but they're not consumed. The burning bush is also a symbol of the preservation of the Bible. How many Bibles have been burned? How many dictators and emperors have said, we're going to destroy the Bible, throw it in a bonfire. There will never be a Bible again. This morning, would you raise your Bible up with me? I want to tell you, this Bible has been burned, but it has not been consumed. And there are more Bibles today, praise His holy name, than there have ever been. Because it has been burned, but it has not been consumed. Amen. I tell you, the burning bush reminds me of a symbol of the, of the people of God, especially Baptist. <laughs> They've been burned at the stake, have they not? They've been killed by the millions. Uh, you, you trace J.M. Carroll's book, The Trail of Blood, or other Baptist historians, and they will say that through the, through the Middle Ages, uh, somewhere up to 50 million Baptists were killed for their faith in God. They were burned, they were drowned, they were speared, they were martyred, they were killed, and yet God's people are still on planet Earth today. They were burned, but they were not consumed. On the contrary side, the burning bush is a symbol of every lost soul that's in hell. Follow me. If you died right now, you would go to hell. And you would burn. But you would not be consumed. I want you to contemplate that with me for just a moment. Yesterday I was talking to a man and witnessing to a guy. And, and he was a young man and... You know, I'm sure in his mind, I have all these years to live, and I'm healthy, and I'm just going to live it up. And he invited me in his house, and I'm pleading with him about the need to be saved. And I, I said to him, you understand that if you don't get saved, you will go to a place called hell. And do you understand that you will burn there, but you will never be consumed? You're burning and burning and burning, but you never burn up. And boy, he looked at me and said, I never thought about it that way. If you're watching online or here in person and you're not saved, I want to tell you, you are heading to a place called hell where the Bible says it is a fire that is never quenched. It's the place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And someday you will stand before the blazing fiery eyes of Jesus Christ at what is called the great white throne judgment. 
And he will open up the books and he will see that your name is not written in the book. And he will say those sad words, I never knew you. And then he will throw you, he will cast you into hell. And death and hell will be thrown into the lake of fire. And if you're lost, I say with a tear in my eye and a broken heart, you will be thrown into a lake of fire. And you will burn and burn, but never be burned up. You say, I don't believe that could happen. It happened thousands of years ago with this bush. So I plead with you, trust Christ and get saved today. You can be saved from the lake of fire. <laughs> Notice it's the angel of the Lord in verse 2. The angel of the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah God. I personally believe that this is a theophany. A theophany is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. And so maybe you're sitting back there and saying, wait a second, I thought Jesus was born in the New Testament. I thought he was born to Mary. He's, this is, this is uh, 1,500 years before he's born, preacher. What do you mean that this was the Lord Jesus Christ that appeared in a flame of fire? Friend, I have good news for you. Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. You cannot have an everlasting Father unless you have an everlasting Son. I've met people before that said, well, I believe God's eternal, but I don't believe Jesus is eternal. It can't be. You cannot logically have an everlasting father unless you have an everlasting son. Jesus is the great I am. He has no beginning, and thank God he has no ending. Right. This is a theophany. We see Jesus Christ all through the Old Testament, and here he appears unto Moses. Why in a flame of fire? Because our God is a consuming fire, Hebrews 12 and 29 says. Fire represents the holiness of God. Fire also represents the deity of Jesus Christ. When they made the tabernacle, uh, they were to use fire, not strange fire. It was representative of the deity of Christ. This flame of fire, this burning bush that was revealed to Moses was telling Moses, you think you're all alone on the backside of the desert, but I'm right here with you. And I am an all-powerful, almighty God. I am so powerful that I can make a bush not be consumed when it's on fire, and I can even speak out of a bush. It was the Lord Jesus Christ, friend. Do you know the Lord can do a lot of amazing things, even in a burning, even in the backside of the desert? The Bible's filled with them. I, I did a study this week on it. This is not an exhaustive list. But do you know where Moses got his Ten Commandments? On the backside of the desert. Uh, do you know where Elijah heard the still small voice of God. It was in the desert. Uh, do you know where the Lord fed 5,000 men plus women and children? If you read your Bible and take a concordance, it said it was in the desert. I love the story of Philip leading the Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord. And the Ethiopian eunuch then gets baptized. But do you remember where that took place? It was in the desert. By the way, aren't you glad God saves souls even in desert times of life? Aren't you glad God answers prayers even in the desert? I'm saying God shows us and allows us to go through the backside of the desert to show us his mighty power. And I want to make the application to say this morning, I believe America is in a desert right now. Would you agree with that? I mean, it's dry. It's desolate. But here's my hope. The same God who appeared to Moses in a burning bush, a flame of fire in the backside of the desert. I'm praying that God would show himself strong to the United States of America, even in the backside of our desert. Would you agree with me? We need a fire to blaze throughout our country once again. And we need a fire of God to blaze in our churches once again. I'm not talking about a shrub on fire. I'm talking about our inner soul getting on fire for God. I think about those two men that walked with Jesus on the Emmaus Road. And, and as Jesus left them, they said, boy, did not our heart burn within us as he spoke to us along the way. Man, I want my heart to burn with fire out of love and zeal and passion for God. May God send a burning bush again to our churches today. See, I don't believe he can do it. Well, he did it there on the backside right. of the desert. And so, number one, we learn about the plans of God. It's not wasted time. God is at work. His machine is at work even on the backside of the desert. We learn about the power of God on the backside of the desert. Number three, I, I love this third lesson. 
We learn about the presence of God on the backside of the desert. The plan of God, the power of God, the presence of God. Moses thought he was all alone with his sheep, but he was wrong, wasn't he? <laughs> Thank God the Lord is ever present. In fact, it's interesting that the Lord knows where you are and the Lord knows who you are, even on the backside of the desert. He knew Moses' name. Moses, in verse 3, said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. I guess it is a great sight, Moses. Why, the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that, he turned aside to see. God called him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Here's what God spoke to me uh, this week about. The Lord knows where I'm at, even when I'm in, all alone on the desert. And look here, the Lord knows who I am. He knows my name. Even when I'm on the backside of the desert. I don't know what you're going through. Maybe you're going through a backside of the desert. Maybe your, your marriage is a desert right now. Maybe your home's a desert. Maybe, again, your life is just empty. I was talking to an individual on Thursday, and, and they said to me, all I can do is just cry. I'm just sad in life. I'm, I'm empty in life. All I can do is cry, and maybe that's how you feel. I have good news for you. The Lord knows where you are, even in your desert. The Lord knows who you are, and the Lord still knows your name. Moses, Moses. And by the way, when God says our name, well, how should we respond? I love it. Here am I. What a great answer. And God says, don't come any closer. I'm glad now the Lord tells us to draw nigh to God, but here he says, don't draw nigh to me. In fact, take off your shoes. Now, don't do that this morning, please, spare us. You're on holy ground. Man, I like that. Again, we often feel deserted in the desert. Friends, God doesn't desert his children when we are in the desert. Amen. Same spelling, two different words. God doesn't desert us when we are in the desert. Just always remember that. Here's something. I, I read a lot of commentaries, and I was studying a lot for this sermon, and no one said this, but aren't you glad we have a Holy Ghost that lives in us that shows us things that man don't even show us? And here's the thought that hit my mind. Look at verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert. Let's stop right there. From Moses' perspective, it looked like the backside of the desert. But here's what God gave me. And came to the mountain of God. Look here. You may think you're on the backside of the desert, but it is still the mountain of God. Amen. There have been many times I felt like I was all alone. Where are you, God? I'm going through a desert. I can't seem to get an answer to prayer. I can't seem to lead anyone to Christ. Things just seem dry and desolate in my life. It seems, where are you, Lord? And God says, you, from your perspective, you're in the backside of the desert. From my perspective, you are in the mountain of God. Man, I love that. And here's the other thought that hit my mind. From Moses' perspective, he thought he was on the backside of the desert. From God's perspective, he said, you're on holy ground. Because I am in your presence. And you are in my presence. Here's the thought. You may be a widow and feel like you're all alone. I tell you, if God's there, that place is the mountain of God. And that place is holy ground. W. Graham Scroggy tells the story of an atheist who wanted to persuade his young son that there was no God. He allowed his young son to go to Sunday school and his young son was learning that there is a God. And so he wanted to convince him otherwise. And so one day while his son was going, this atheist father, one day while his son was going to Sunday school, he thought, I will make a sign. And uh, let me get Alyssa, if you can come up here. Colby, could you come up here? Michelle, Esperanza, can you guys, ladies, come up here? Let me get Melvin, can you, guys, can you come up here? And Juan and Justin, that will be good. You guys can just line up right here. Melissa, why don't you come down this way? All right, very good. 
And so he, he made this sign while his son went to Sunday school. And the sign said, God is N O W H Brian, can I get you one of the Brian's? You're going to be R. R E. And so when that son came home from Sunday school, that atheist father said, I got it. He said, Son, look at the sign. God is nowhere. There is no God. And the son looked at it, and the son said, I love it, Dad. Dad said, huh? Because the son just said, God is right over. Not God is nowhere, but God is now here. Look here. There are some times in life, let's take off our Pharisee mask, when we feel like God is nowhere. And at those times, I want to tell you, God is now here. When you're on the backside of the desert in your life, and you feel like, where are you at, God? You're nowhere. God says, this is the mountain of God. This is holy ground. Take off your shoes. Because you're in the presence of God. And when you think God is nowhere, the truth is God is now here. Amen. Thank you, young people. I'm so glad to see you this morning. You may be seated. You can just put them on the pew or wherever you want to put them. I'm saying this morning, aren't you glad the Lord is with us on the backside of the desert? And the Lord allows us to go through the backside of the desert to reveal his presence to us. I want you to turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 35. We'll bring it in for a landing. Isaiah chapter 35. This is a great chapter on the millennial reign, but we can make the application. Isaiah 35 verse 1. The Bible says, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Then if you skip down for sake of time to verse 6. Then shall the lame man leap as in heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and would you underline these words, and streams in the desert. Our God is such a great God that even when you're going through a desert, maybe you've been falsely accused, maybe you've been wrongly treated, maybe you've been bitterly uh, treated upon by even a loved one, Maybe again, something in your home or life is like a desert and you say, God is nowhere. Where are you? He's nowhere to be seen. I want to tell you, God is now here and God can make waters come from our wilderness and God can bring streams even in the desert. Amen. He's a great God, isn't he? Amen. And I look back in my life at some of the desert experiences where it was such dry, parched land. I said, Lord, where are you at? I'd fast and pray and say, oh, God, I feel like my ministry is so fruitless. Oh, God, where are you at? And, man, those are the times when so many times God would say, here, let me give you some streams in the desert. I tell you, God goes with his people even on the backside of the desert. We are not deserted even when we are in the desert. And so I want to ask you a few questions this morning. Number one. Are you going through a desert experience right now? Well, please remember that you are not deserted, even in the desert. We trust the Lord's plans. I don't always understand God's plans, but we know this. God makes no mistakes, right? Amen. Do you believe God can do a mighty work even in the desert? Some of the mightiest works in all the Bible took place in the middle of the desert. And the same God that spoke from a burning bush is the same God that can work in my life and your life. 
Do you believe the Lord is ever present, even in the desert? God is nowhere. No, 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 friends. God is now here. Amen. And he can take the backside of the desert and make it into the mountain of God. He can take the backside of the desert and make it into holy ground. 